Greetings and welcome to the Upper Pen Podcast. My name is Dakota and today I'm talking with forensic anthropologist Dr. Erin Kimmerly about her book, We Carry Their Bones. Dr. Kimmerly recounts the excavation she and her team conducted at the Dozier Boys School. The book also examines the origins of the institution and the results of that particular boys school. So thank you, Dr. Kimmerly, for joining me. Thank you for having me. So some of the people who watch this might not know uh, what I mean when I say boys school. Can you give a little rundown of what that means? Sure. Uh, the, the Dozier School or the Florida um, Industrial Reform School, as it was first called, opened in 1900. And initially it was for boys and girls. Basically, any child who was convicted of a crime had been part of the convict lease system. Florida really didn't have prisons at the time. And so it was a way to get, or the idea was uh, to get the children out of the convict lease system. And girls were actually there for the first 14 years. And then they split and, and um, began their own school. That was a time when the um, dormitories burned and um, there was a big fire. And so unfortunately, a lot of the records were lost. So we didn't, we didn't um, say much about that. We just, we don't have very much information about who those early girls were. So how did you, a forensic anthropologist, get brought in? I know you covered in the first part of the book, but just a brief. Well, the school, um, you know, since, since it opened in 1900, all the way until when it closed in 2011, was under continuous investigations by the state. Um, and also federally, it was taken over in the 1980s for a period of time. But what happened in about 2005 is a group of men who had been uh, incarcerated there as children, uh, you know, teenagers in the 1950s and 60s came together and uh, started sharing their stories and sharing them publicly. You know, they were starting to find each other on the internet for the first time. They were surprised to learn that the school was still open at that time. And so that, you know, sort of through, through their initial stories and recounting what could happen to them, which included physical and sexual abuse, um, other men started coming forward. So um, I think at this point, over 500 men have come forward with very similar stories and experiences. Um, there was also uh, on the edge <laughs> of that, what had been 1400 acre school um, and, and farm was uh, a little burial ground. And the crosses, there were 31 crosses put there in the 1990s to commemorate children who died. They had very poor records and not a great idea of who was buried there, but um, the school said, well, we think 31 is more than enough. And so that's what they put there. So as these men were coming forward, um, families started coming forward too, um, particularly sisters and brothers and nephews of boys who had died at the school, wanting answers, um, wanting to know what happened to them, and ultimately wanting them returned to them for, for burial and family burial ground. So I remember when um, I first heard the name Dozier uh, Boys School, it was a while ago. And the first um, adult man that came forward seemed to be immediately discounted by all of the press, it seemed like, um, because he didn't lead a perfect life. And <laughs> that just seems so strange to me that you're, you're gonna say, no, nothing could have ever happened because you're not a perfect person, right? Right. Yeah, I think that um, there was a lot of, you know, media that supported the men and the stories they were um, sharing and their experiences they were sharing. But there was also a lot of media, particularly out of that community um, in North Florida, that was very much sort of against changing the narrative that they liked to tell, which was that this was a reform school that helped boys and nothing, nothing bad ever happened there. And um, so they said, you know, a lot of, there was a lot of pushback and, and pushback for our work as well. But, um, you know, the fact that they were traumatized as children, I think, you know, added to um, the struggles that they had in their life. And, and many of them talk about that, alcoholism, substance abuse, abusive relationships, in and out of prison, 
um, you know, some of them turned it around and became very successful. You know, others struggled their whole lives. Many of the men I talked to had never before told anyone about their experience and the abuse, not even a wife or their family members. Um, and so it was, you know, I think very, you know, important for them to, to face it and to share it at this point. Um, you know, kind of takes that a weight off, if you will. Um, but yeah, they definitely, you know, felt the, the effects of that trauma their whole life. And then, of course, their children, and you talk to them, and the, and the same thing, the, the, you know, people who lost a family member, like the, the men and women who've been searching their whole life for their missing brother, um, even, you know, their children grew up with this search and sense of injustice. And so it's really multi generational effects of trauma. So when I was reading, I was I was really like happy how you portrayed all of the men that were coming to support you and say, hey, <laughs> thank you for finally doing something. Um, it was really great to see mm -hmm. them as individuals, how you portrayed them in the book. So, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was, you know, we, I worked on this from, you know, really 2011 is when I started writing for letters of permission to do the work. And then, uh, was still back doing field work again in 2018. So you really get to know people um, and the you know the families and, di and different um, folks at government agencies. You know we, we spent a lot of time working together on this. Yeah. So um, I was recently in an anthropology master's program, and a large part of it was focused on ethics. And the first third of your book made me so mad <laughs> because there were just so many people trying to stonewall you. And I don't understand. I yeah. And often in the name of ethics, you know, that's, that's, it's, that's what was very frustrating um, for me. And as an academic to see that pushback within, you know, within the archeological community and then saying, this is unethical. I mean, that's just, that was like, you know, personally very much a challenge to try to, to grapple with. And, um, and so, you know, the one thing I tried to do in our, in our team and everybody who worked with us tried to always just bring it back to the main point, which is that families have a right to know what happens and they have a right to the remains of their loved ones. We all do. That's a very fundamental basic right. And that's what it's about is making sure that everyone has access to the justice system and access to, um, you know, access to the burials of their loved ones and so on. And, and that's, you know, that was the core of it. And so we just tried to keep coming back to that. So how did you, in the book, you talk about how there's um, like the townspeople and there are people who want to be on your side, but they can't really talk about it. So how did you deal with this animosity from the town, but also like this, the waiter at the cafe who's like, oh yeah, what you guys are doing is great. Just don't tell anybody I said that. Right, and we heard that a lot, like over and over I hear that. Um, you know, I understand it because they, you know, and they would, they would say, I have to keep living here. Um, you know, there's definitely a power structure and if you've spent any time in small towns, I'm from a small town and you, you know, you, that's definitely a very real, you know, local politics. It's just it's a very real thing. But, um, but at the same time, it can be very frustrating because it's like this code of silence and it's like, it works because everyone adheres to it. Right. And so, you know, it, as sort of the activist in me that always is trying to get out, it's like, look, if we collectively, if we all say it together, you know, there's power in, in that, you're not alone. Um, but breaking through is, is really the challenge. I, it just seemed very impressive that you, you and your team stuck with it so hard and you had people who you could turn to, um, a couple of the family members were uh, kind of influential in getting some of the things going that were getting stonewalled by the community or by um, the archaeology uh, portion of right. anthropology. Yeah. yeah, and that's what, you know, I felt like was really taking 
you know, we're following their lead. I mean, this was what they wanted. It's what, and so we were doing this really for them in that, in that sense. And, um, and in the, you know, in the bigger picture, sort of the historic justice, you know, issue is, is like what it was for. So, and that was an important thing because, you know, in some of that pushback, people, you know, sort of projected it as if it was just my wishes or, you know, as a, as a biological anthropologist, you just want to dig up skeletons, but no, actually, that's <laughs> not the case at all. So, you know, that was the key is it was what they wanted. Um, we now have science and tools and technology that make it possible, you know, wouldn't, it would not have been possible in 1970 to, you know, do the DNA and the right, and to do um, all the remote sensing and everything that we did. So I think we have the capacity now and um, the other thing I think is a really key piece um, is that working within a university, though, we have academic freedom, and that is what is the counter to that sort of political pressure. You know, I think if you work for other agencies or private companies, you know, that may hold up or, or may not. And so I think what also made it possible was the fact that we have academic freedom, which is always being tested and challenged. So I don't take it for granted at all, but I, I think this is an example of why it's so important. It seemed like a really good aspect of the university that they had like lawyers on call for you <laughs> to like kind yeah, of go yeah. over <laughs> some of the legal implications and like, no, you guys are good. <laughs> yeah, they, and they were, I mean, uh, Gerard Solis, the head counsel there, is the most brilliant lawyer ever. I, yeah, and he's there for the university, not you know, personal legal team, but it, but um, they were very invested and you know, capable and smart and made it possible. So. Well, it seemed like some of the people that were very against your excavation were targeting the university at some point too. Like, how could you let them do this? This is so unethical. Um, so it seems right. pretty natural to have their lawyer attached. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's that's what you see, or you know, what I've seen, like even in recent um, examples, other examples, and other issues that were politics, you know, weren't you know bleeds into what's going on, um, whether it's curriculum or other you know other issues on campuses, and you see that pressure and. Sometimes universities give into it, hope, hopefully not, and hopefully they you know, continue to not um, as you know, different issues come up because that, you know, that's why tenure is so important, you know, that and that is why um, academic freedom is so important. And it gets kind of lost, they think sometimes in the shuffle and people just talk about it casually as if it's you know, not understanding how important it is and so many things. I mean, in diff all different areas of, of science and social science could you know, potentially have implications, right? Hope, hopefully all of our work is impactful in some way. So, you know, there's a lot of different uh, ways in which this issue keeps coming up. So that kind of brings up, why do you think it was important beyond giving closure to family uh, members or even the, the men who came forward? Why was this such an important project? For me, it just represents, um, an example of you know this historic justice issue, which I think there are many examples, and a need for um, you know this type or in some form, maybe not exactly this, but it, you know this type of or some type of investigation. You look at so many different civil rights cases, um, redlining, you know, in predatory land practice issues when it comes to African-American neighborhoods and burial grounds, um, all of the Indian residential schools where, you know, there's over 400 in the U.S. But I would put my money down and all of them had, had deaths and, and burials at some point. So I think um, these type of issues that are not exactly a modern criminal issue, but not truly, you know, archaeological, historic, they fall in between, and it's really tough for people in those situations to get any of the systems we have to work for them. You know, it just doesn't fit neatly, and so I think it's a challenge to our legal system to, you know, maybe think more in terms of, like, restorative and historic justice and how some of this can be addressed. 
think people don't always understand that um, like a forensic anthropology is not like on television. <laughs> so you don't just get to go do these things or um, you don't get to just go try and make justice in the world, right? Somebody has to file a complaint or some issue has to be raised, right? Well, most, most forensic anthropology, I mean, it's, it's kind of two parts, the lab work, you know, skeletal analysis, like the, the heart, the core of it is um, skeletal biology, right? What do bones tell us? Um, and then the other part is the recovery, search and recovery. So, search, you know, where you're bringing in archaeological methods, although it's very much adapted, it's not traditional archaeology, but you're trying to locate and excavate crime scenes or find a time burial. And I think for a lot of forensic anthropologists, I mean, this project would, they would look at it and say that's, you know, a bit out of what they do. Some of them work just in the lab, some do lab and field work. But I think for a, a big number of forensic anthropologists, though, who do human rights work, who work internationally, this would feel very familiar. You know, it's very much like those types of investigations all around the world, um, you know, post-conflict situations. And so that's something that I try to always, you know, always, you know, in the cold case work we do and other work we do, try to bring that sort of sensibility and um, understanding that there's a lot of ways in which you know, anthropology can contribute. And um, it's, you know, there's the science side of it, but there's also the social justice side of it. I was, I was genuinely shocked with how many um, small, like cultural fracture or like infractures were causing these young boys to end up in this kind of institution. Like, being truant, you could end up in a boys school, right? Like that just seems so strange. Well, part of it was um, the laws were changed quite intentionally to increase the number of boys incarcerated. And so non-criminal offenses were now being sentenced by judges, incorrigibility. It's how you, know, it's how you have a five-year-old sentenced by a judge or being incorrigible and sent there. Um, and so it's, really speaks to, you know, the entire convict system was like that at the time you see, right, vagabond laws, transportation laws, where they're set up to, you know, restrict movement and freedom of anyone of color. And that's, you know, we're talking about during segregation, which is, is basically a category for just not white. It was, you know, black, Latino, um, you know, all sorts of different categories, you know, disabled, um, gay, you know, a lot of boys end up in that category. It's very fluid in terms of how it's defined. And so, um, and so you see, and I think that's what kind of shocks me, if anything, if anything shocks me, was going through the records and seeing where there was school officials really lobbying to change the laws to expand the types of offenses and then the sentencing and then give the manager of the school control over determining parole, whereas it had been decided by the judge initially. And, um, and so they lobbied and, they, and they, got, they got their changes. And then in the book, you actually make like a logical leap for, from that to like, it was basically indentured servitude, right? They were renting these boys out to do manual labor at different institutions. They would, yeah, there's so many examples. At one point, there's one superintendent who buys land adjacent to the school. He has the boys go over, cut all the uh, timber for, um, for lumber, I'm sorry, cut all the trees for lumber, and then sells it back to the school <laughs> for a profit, you know, to, and keeps the money. Um, they're hired out to local farms and businesses um, for labor. And then at some point, I'm not sure when, but they, it was incumbent on the families to basically send money or send a bus ticket. So once they were paroled, they could go home. And if they couldn't, then they would go and basically be indentured servants and have to work for their bus ticket. But while you're doing that, you have to pay rent and food. And there were a number of boys who actually died once they were um, paroled, if you will, out to local um, farms and they would bring them back um, dead. And there's really no explanation what happened to them. It just seems like this is such a, 
because the history of the place goes back to 1900, it just seems like there's so many issues that got entangled with this one school in particular uh, that you can just draw all these lines to. And it just seems like it was Mm -hmm. a mess. Like, how did you even go about trying to untangle things like this? Well, a lot of, you know, a lot of time was spent, I mean, a couple of years really just doing the research, pulling, you know, trying to find any original records, reports, you know, um, legislative reports, certainly the scholarly works that are out there on things like the convict lease system, which there's some great books and great materials out there. Not a lot, I mean, not, not a lot, but there's great materials. So I just really tried to... I think we, you know, tackled it chronologically, even though in the book um, made the decision to not try to tackle it chronologically, just so that I, you know, didn't want it to feel so much like a like a history book, more of a more of a narrative and a story of like how everything was uncovered. But um, but yeah, it just it took a couple of years of, of deep research and trying to find as many original records to cross reference to you know, be as accurate as possible. Well, going back to having, um, being a professor, you had, you had access to graduate students too, right? Who could help go mm-hmm. through some of these older records. That must've been a handy. Graduate <laughs> students, yep. And some undergrads that helped, they did tremendous work and then helped every part of it. So in the field, um, all the field work, all the lab work. I mean, they're a great group. Some some of them are still around that were there from the beginning and others, you know, many of course have graduated and moved off, but, um, but yeah, just tremendous um, effort and commitment by all of them. Well, I've been on one archeological dig ever and it was in, it was on an island in Lake Michigan in the summer. And I can't even imagine doing what you guys did in Florida in the summer <laughs> or in the rain. <laughs> like that must have been awful. Yeah, there were some very challenging <laughs> field work days. The heat, uh, it, and even before we excavated, I think it was the summer, that summer before where we were doing um, basically ground penetrating radar and then test trenches to confirm like what you know, are these burials what are, what are we finding and um we were there in july and it's just it's just a, <laughs> it's never a good decision <laughs> but sometimes it's unavoidable you know so um and then of course when we were there in december we had heat lamps because you know it's cold and you're on the ground and the ground is really cold so it makes you colder and so um there was some extreme uh weather and the there it's really not soil it's clay I mean it's such hard it's like you know it's, it's more like chiseling than shoveling or traveling um so there were there were definitely field challenges since you had students with you was it difficult to kind of like um show them how to kind of chisel through this red this clay mm-hmm. right like to not damage bones or any artifacts that are left but you have to get through it somehow mm-hmm. right <laughs> They do, and they did. They did great. Um, I mean, we we and and in addition to the students, we also had volunteers from probably um, twenty different agencies. Um, you know, crime scene, um, mortician. You know, diff, you know, different kind of related but peripheral fields came and helped, and so um, it was just a great learning training opportunity for everyone. Which you know, but you should, you know, good field work. You show them how to do it, and then the next day they. They do it and um, just learn by by experience. It's got to be crushing, though, the first time your trowel slips and you hit something that you're not supposed to. <laughs> so I can imagine having a lot of nerves in that situation as like somebody just learning to do this. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, that's true. And then, you know, the field work itself and you're not used to those are conditions, but um they did great. I'm so proud of everybody who helped. And we um, would set up, uh, we had this, um, Pat Brewster was a uh, uh, retired funeral home director. He and his wife had a food truck. And so they would, you know, set up and um, provide meals for everybody. And Femurs is a Florida, it's, it's like the DMORT equivalent. It's a, it's a statewide uh, program for mass disaster response. And they have a whole network of volunteers and 
and people who do that kind of work. So they were there to give logistics support, which cannot be understated. You know, there's so much field equipment, cleaning the equipment, packing, transportation, you know, all of that for, for an operation like this. And so that was a great resource. And, you know, those sort of things I think make it possible and a lot more comfortable. So. I was, I was still shocked when you're mentioning that you have all these people, especially law enforcement members that you've worked with in the past on finding missing persons remains. Um, and then in the town, you're still having trouble getting information from the sheriff and the sheriff's department. And I was just like, how, like, what? <laughs> yeah, if they, you know, if they had or, you know, if this had happened in a county where if the local agency said, hey, we're going to open an investigation, it's like that whole world, that whole system opens up to you and it would have been very routine. And, um, and then, of course, if they don't, then you're stuck. And it, for me, I think that's where a lot of, um, especially like long-term missing persons cases fall because for one reason or another, they've fallen through the cracks. And so um, they're not in the system, which it's not a perfect system, but it can work if you know if you have to get into it. And so um, for me, there's just a lot of parallels with this, with, with you know these other issues and other work that we do. And um, the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office and Sheriff G, who's based here in Tampa, but who provided all that support, law enforcement numbers, um, I mean everything from logistics to just political support. I mean, he's um, just such an incredible person and, and uh, I, they probably had 20 or 25 different people from their agency over the course of this come and help at one point or another so I'm really grateful to them and you know try, hopefully it comes through because it, to me they represent like how it could be you know <laughs> and um so hopefully that you know shows you know shows that as well so it definitely comes through that these these people in the it was the FDLE, right? That's the acronym. That's the um, the state agency, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, who did the initial um, 2008 2009 oh, okay. investigation. Yeah, yeah. so it, they're the ones that said that nothing was untoward here, right? Like nothing needed to be investigated further. Okay. Right. <laughs> so it's just. Yeah. I don't know, you You have all these people from law enforcement that are willing to help and want to learn and they're ready to be there. And then you have these other agencies and it comes very, very well. It comes across very well in the book that like there are some people that are just willing and able to help. And then there are some people that will do everything to stop something. Yeah, <laughs> right. I think that's just reflective, you know, in general of, um, you know, of law enforcement today because you see so much variation when it comes to criminal investigations, cold case investigations. It's like some people are doing everything and others won't touch it. And it's, um, and probably my guess would be that most people in the public, if you don't, you know, work in that world at all, you think it's all the same because, you know, it looks very sort of uniform and systematic, but it's not <laughs> at all. And so uh, that's the challenge. It's like where you live, you know, is going to affect what kind of um, quality, you know, uh, investigation you get. Yeah. Um. So as kind of a wrap up, your final chapter is called um, What Remains? And it is so beautifully written. I want it, it it's just so good. So good job. That was fantastic. <laughs> I love yeah. all of all of the sections that start with we remember or we know. And it kind of just drives home this sense that these boys were real and what happened to them was real. Um, and so mm -hmm. that ending just feels really heavy, but also like it was, I don't know, it was so good. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was, um, you know, that was the challenge uh, with writing. I think it took me a very long time ultimately to put this together because uh, like on the one hand, there's there's so much sort of findings, like, right, like it's 
like if you think you're, you know, you, you are in school, like if you're thinking of thesis conclusions, right, or it's like there's so much um, sort of factual information and background and history, but then I didn't want it to just, you know, read like a technical report, which I write all the time, because, you know, um, that, you know, I think you lose people. <laughs> um, and so I, um, I hope that, you know, we're able to sort of convey that, the, you know, the racial discrepancy, um, the fact that this is very much just, you know, a story of why civil rights are important are and continue to be, you know, something we have to protect and fight for and, um, and that they were very much individual, you know, children that were, you know, their families were forever affected. I want more forensic anthropology to be written like this instead of just research papers or white papers, because <laughs> um, it just seems so much more relatable and much more important, I guess, is how I would frame it. Um, mm -hmm. Because you inject your a lot of yourself in it, like you talk about your boys all the time, and that really relates to how these young children were, right? Right. Yeah. That's the and you know, and I'll say as a, as an anthropologist and scientist, like that was hard to sort of get comfortable with because that's different for me in terms of writing. Um, but I, but it's also was very true. I mean, you know, having two little boys, so you know as I'm doing all this work and research, it's just, you know, as, as scientists, we always separate ourselves from our work and we, and we do that, but you're still a person and you're still doing this for, you know, very much a social justice issue. And so it's hard to not just see, you know, the little individuals and, you know, I don't mean stories, but like in a sense, you know, you're, you're finding the stories of each of those boys, right, through the research and it's just, um, you just see them as the people that they were. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kimberly, for joining me today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, we Carry Their Bones is out now. The topic is pretty heavy, but it's incredibly important, especially right now when people are starting to, again, ask for more justice to be done, especially in historic cases or even modern cases like this. So thank you for bringing it up again. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. Um, I highly recommend the book. And as always, thanks for listening and have a great day. Bye.